Hey everybody, welcome back to another Nature's Always Right episode with Stephen Cornett. Today I'm at my friend's house, Blake Reimer, Tennessee Mountain Farm, who raises Mangalitsa and Duroc pigs. So I wanted to show you guys today his confinement operation, which is a Korean natural farming bedding system. Something that's so cool about Korean natural farming, besides all the stuff for soil, uh, increasing soil fertility, is the animal systems that Master Cho developed. So. Uh, we're gonna look at the baby pigs as well. He just had uh, these two girls right behind here had their first litters. Uh, I'm also gonna have Blake come in here and he's gonna tell us more about his bedding system and his experience with raising these pigs the last three years. I'll also show you Rambo, which is a special Duroc boar, a male that we got from Cliff Davis of Pig and Leaf. So in the pig world, uh, Cliff Davis and Henry Fudge are pretty famous uh, in, in terms of creating this old line Duroc breed, which Blake is now bred with his Mangalitsas. So Blake's gonna get more into that with us. So let's go check out, I just wanna show you the Korean natural farming bedding system and how that works. Cause I'm standing, I'm sitting right next to poop right here and it does not stink at all in here. I know, you know, we sort of think of pigs as stinky, dirty animals, but if you give them the right environment, they're really not. So. Let's go check out the bedding and we're gonna check out the piggies in a little bit. Okay you guys, so now I'm in the boar pen with Rambo. Blake just set this up so that he could separate them from the sows while they're uh, having the babies and raising and nursing and all that uh, to help keep them safer. And here is the KNF bedding system. So underneath all of this, Blake brought in like 50, you know, pretty big size logs, you know, maybe 12 inch diameter down to six inch that the logs create an air space underneath all this to keep it from going anaerobic and, and super stinky um, then he did wood chips and some straw in here and then he'll keep adding wood chips over time as well to replenish that carbon uh, and then the manure mixes with all that carbon and creates you know really good soil now, in addition to that, in the KNF bedding system, they also add in microbiology. I've talked a lot about lactobacillus or labs. Um, that is, those um, microbes love to feed on the stinky anaerobes. So you inoculate that in here, um, and you do it. You know, maybe every three months, you're reapplying some labs, and that processes all that manure, that stinkiness, and gets rid of it. Uh, in addition to that, you also add in IMO 4 or 5 or even 3 would be good as well. And then those in indigenous microorganisms um, also help to process the manure. And actually in a, a KNF system, they're always raised in confinement. They don't do pasture raised, but it's a much more natural system than conventional farming. So here's a better angle of what the KNF bedding looks like. So you can see some of the wood here. Um, there's charcoal at the very bottom. I forgot to mention that. And Charcoal is an excellent home for microbes. The pore space in charcoal is incredibly large. So when it's there at the bottom, all the urine, uh, manure, like all the liquids that might drain through to the bottom, uh, they'll get processed by microbes down here. Um, this, and charcoal also absorbs smells as well. So this is a really important part of that. So yeah, this is just a really fantastic system. If you wanna raise a pig in confinement, this is a 12 by 12. You could probably, I think you could put two pigs in a 12 by 12 and that would work out. Um, if you're on a small scale, you know, you don't have a big area, uh, you don't, you're not able to pasture raise, or like Blake, he's raising feeders. He has a boar and sows to raise them out, to sell them or to grow them out for his own farm and sell the meat. Uh, so yeah, this is a fantastic system. So now let's get Blake in here and let's hear a little bit more about um, his experience with raising the pigs and how he, developed his little system here and learn some more. Hi, I'm Blake Reimer and welcome to Tennessee Mountain Farm. As we're starting this video though, you can hear some background noise and we can go over here to see it's baby pig feeding time. <laughs> this seems to happen about every 45 minutes here. And if you look over there, we have the mamas are co-parenting babies together. They were born on the same day and from day one, they just started going back and forth between both the mamas. So what do you have to do when you're when you're raising them? Like, do they get cold at night? Do they? I am just making it up as I go along. And then also a few phone calls to Cliff Davis to make sure I'm not really messing it up too bad. Um, and the baby pigs do have a setup over here. 
with a wind block coming mm -hmm. this way and then two heat lamps over the top of them. Right. The day they were born, it got down to 28 degrees. And then for the first week of their life here, it's been up in the mid 40s and then down to the low 20s at night. Between the mamas building a nest together and blocking them, and then the heat lamps on them. Mm -hmm. Cliff said it's important just to keep the wind off of them and keep them dry. And having a deep litter bedding system like this in a barn helps me do both of those really well. Um, the dry part comes from having so many layers of carbon stacked on top of each other that their urine never really creates a wet spot. And so having a dry place is easy. I just add some more straw and bedding to it right before they had their babies. Farrowing would be the pig term for that. And they seem to really take that, spread it out themselves, make a nest, and that created a wind block as well for the, for the babies. Yeah. Uh, and then other than that, it's make sure that the mamas have water, make sure they have feed, and they take care of everything else. Very cool. So why did you want to set up this KNF bedding system in the first place? Why not do a more conventional system? How'd you come to this conclusion that this is what you needed to do? When I came back to the farm four years ago, I started slaughtering chickens with a friend of mine who was doing pastured poultry and had been doing it already for 10 years at that time. Um, and while we're working our way through a day of that, we start talking about ways to grow pigs and he mentions a K and F system to me at the time. <clears throat> and I've been in traditional commercial pig barns in the past as a fourth generation farmer. I've been around a lot of things and I did not want that. Uh, the, the smell is not something that's pleasant. Uh, the environment doesn't seem to be pleasant. And, um, and so when I started thinking about pigs, I looked at the pasture option and I had them outside with just electric netting for the first year with some uh, little white Yorkshire pigs just to get used to pigs. And you start carrying water every day for a winter time as it's freezing. And that encouraged me to figure out another way to be able to have pigs in the winter. So it wasn't mm -hmm. about water twice a day just to make sure they were okay. The K and F system works well with that, especially at Rambo's water we can look. I was able to get it frost free from the ground up. And then the K and F system has some heat that builds up in it. Mm -hmm. And that helps keep it away from being frosted in the morning time. Interesting. Um, with the babies, the same thing for them being able to stay warm. As it's cold here in the morning, when the mamas stand up, you see steam rising out of the nest that they've built for the night. Wow. And so the babies are okay down in there just for the nighttime with just the mamas. The heat lamps are just in case they need a place to go to. And so the idea of a no smell, no fly indoor pig pen, I mean, it sounds fantastic. It almost sounds like a dream. Uh, did not think it, that it would be this effective when I started. This is, I would say, my version four of getting a deep bedding system um, up to this level. What are a couple of mistakes that you made and how did you uh, fix them? Or you said it's version four, so what, what were some of the improvements that you made? Yeah, the, 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 the layers start with a layer of charcoal and to be able to make your own lump charcoal for a 600, 800 square foot area that's gonna be four to six inches. I had some learning curves for how to make large scale burns to make charcoal enough. Started with a 50 gallon barrel and making 30 gallons at a time. But when that takes four and a half hours and you end up with 30 gallons that covers three square feet, um, I knew I had to ramp up for that. And so taking some time to figure out how to make a large amount of charcoal was one of the steps uh, sourcing the wood to go on top of the charcoal it, dragging 40 foot logs out of the out of the tr woods is not easy um, and so sourcing those staging those things over time um, helped me get to the point of putting it in and then i learned that it is absolutely necessary to have those two steps before you add wood chips Hmm. Because if you just try to do a three foot deep wood chip bedding, everything's going to compact on itself and you're going to be in there every day with a pitchfork turning over the top foot of that so that they have something to sit down into. Otherwise, it's going to be a manure pat two and a half feet off the ground. 
but you won't be able to get the airflow through it. Okay. Uh, I learned that through having baby pigs in a system for eight months that ended up getting pretty dirty for me um, over time and being a lot of work. Um, whereas these pigs over here, this is my first pen that I built in a long format for the pigs. It's two years old and I've had pigs in here for two years solid where I just keep on adding wood chips to the top of it. Wow. Now, because it was an existing barn and I didn't think about how I could get in the ground with a post, I was trying to tie these posts in with the logs that I had underneath them. And pigs can put a lot of weight on these things and so they started pushing them over. That's why I have to have this bracing designed here like a uh, New Zealand A brace almost for a mm. corner post and a mm -hmm. fence tying in with the metal so it can't move back and forth. And then, <clears throat> thanks to our friend Kyle Bell over at Forest Fed Farm loaning me a battery operated auger, we were able to put these posts in the ground about two feet. Um, and then that has kept them from being able to come back on me and make a lot nicer look on the, the post itself. Yeah, did you cement those in or just they're just in the dirt? They are just in the dirt with a okay. tamping right, type nice. pack tamp. So, so build things stronger than you think it's going to need. Absolutely. <laughs> it, and it's not like a pig is going to be destructive on purpose. They're going to mm -hmm. be destructive through curiosity. It's just rubbing. And you also have to think about how much they like to get their backs rubbed mm -hmm. and that they're going to rub on things themselves yeah. just for that back scratch. So these are Mangalitsas, and tell us a little bit more about these, because these are a pretty rare breed. They're a rare breed. They came to the United States in 2003, I think, for the first time from Hungary, and they're a large breed of pigs. Under this woolly hair here is a lot of pig fat. They're American pigs that we have are made for lean muscle, so you get a lot of meat mm -hmm. with the pig. These were bred for lard production, for a lot of fat. Now, my personal theory on that is because in the 1800s, the more pig fat that you had when you slaughtered a pig, the longer you could cook in the winter time mm -hmm. because it was their form of oil for cooking. I don't know that to be certain, but the Royal Mangalitsa um, is a very fatty pig with a fat composition like the Wagyu cattle from Japan that has oleic acid in it so it melts in your mouth instead of globular feel hmm. um, i've bitten into a pork chop before that did not feel good in my mouth and when i started growing pigs i wanted something that everything was great and yeah. now you got into the duroc and why the duroc what's what's special about that pig there's a lot special about this particular Duroc. Right. But for me, getting into the Duroc breed, crossing with the Mangalitsa pig, came from a trip to Benton Country Hams in Madisonville, Tennessee. Mom and I were visiting in Madisonville with a country ham business. And the gentleman, Alan Benton, that owns the place was giving us a really nice tour. And I'd ask him if he had heard of the curly haired pigs. Cause I was looking for a breed of pigs to have on the farm that were different. I wanted something special and I heard of these pigs. And I said, Mr. Ben, have you heard of the curly haired pigs? He said, oh, you mean that Mangalitsa pig? <laughs> yes, he goes, oh, I've heard of them. I've even been over to Spain where they have those Ibericos. They got Mangalitsas there too, I tried it. What'd you think? He said, it's good, it's real good. There's a lot of fat though. Well, that makes sense, I'd see now why. And I thought, well, what's your favorite pig? He said, oh, I like that Duroc. I said, you mean the big red pig? He said, yep, they long, they got more belly on them. I sell belly, mm. so I like those. You know, if a person crossed that Mangalitsa and Duroc, that might be the best pig I could imagine. Anyway, let's go back here and look at these hams. And we got in the car and I just told mom, I said, well, I don't have to worry about what kind of pig to get anymore. I'm gonna get a Mangalitsa and a Duroc and cross it. Mm. Um, so here we are two and a half years later and last year I had a, another Duroc pig and we had 23 of the Mangalitsas Durocs born on the farm and this was the nicest sow out of those that were born. So she's 50% Mangalitsa, 50% Duroc. 
And then this year, I was able to acquire ownership in this pig from Cliff Davis and Henry Fudge Rambo. And he's a very special Duroc. Um, just quickly, some of the main differences from him and the previous one I had is that they're about the same age already at three years old. The other boar had become completely mature or determinate by 18 months. He was about 800 pounds. He's a big boar. It would probably take Rambo another year and a half to get to that full maturity. So he's going to be a longer lasting boar for my operation. Mm -hmm. And the babies that come from him will be longer lasting pigs on my farm. And I'd like to be able to have a breed of pigs that I could keep for a long time that produce consistently well-balanced babies. And that's where Rambo is bringing in the, the beginning of that genetics for a long time of having a herd that's gonna do great here on the farm. <clears throat> now I have that one pig separated out from all the other Mangalitsas now, because everybody's pregnant. But since her babies are gonna be 75% Duroc and 25% Mangalitsa, I'm gonna keep them separate for a while and then mark them with a cut on their ears, just so we know which pigs are which as the others come out, because everything else here will be 50-50 uh, Mangalitsa Duroc. And if you wanna see a video of me and Blake going to pick up this pig and a little tour of Cliff's farm, it's a really cool video uh, about that process and uh, talking about those notches in the ear, that's just uh, something that pig breeders do rather than uh, using a tagging system that's a way that they can look at a pig and instantly know um, what mother it came from and, and the details about the genetics, the litter, the litter and size from, and all yeah. that. When I've been telling people about the pen that I have for the pigs, I found it an easy way to explain is that I have two things in this pen. There's pigs and then there's microorganisms. And it takes the pigs to feed the microorganisms to get them to live and the microorganisms help make the pigs a place where they can live and they grow together. I've also learned that the microorganisms can grow in numbers so that they can respond to more pigs being in a pen. It just takes a little time for them to catch up to your density in a pen. But after they catch up, you no longer have to turn the bedding. You don't have to be in the bedding. They do it all. It is one big recycling center. And then another question that I've gotten um, often is, well, when do you clean it out? And my answer to that is maybe in 10 years is what I think this might be because it's gonna take a long time for the solid logs to go away and I can just keep adding more wood chips to the top of it. And um, after a while, I, I don't really have to re-inoculate with the microorganisms. But any time that I start to smell a uh, manure smell, I'll come in and spray that day, and by the next day, that's gone as well. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it's, it's a big thing about there's two living organisms here. There's pigs and there's microorganisms. Something to think about if you're considering a KNF bedding system for uh, pigs, for chickens, for any farm animal, is the videos you see online, most people dig a hole down in the ground and fill it up and come up. And... <clears throat> I just didn't want to do all that digging. And so I thought, I don't have to dig a hole, I'll just build up. And then it lets the pigs be up here. So it almost creates a better viewing for the public to see the pigs. But it also lets me build a deep system without having to dig down in the ground or build anything down. So you can build a KNF in many different ways, just as long as you get that layer of carving and the microorganisms active in there, then you can have your deep bedding. But some people think, well, I don't have a hole. You don't have to have a hole. Go up, and you can see that the, the pigs do fine in that way, too. All right, Blake, thanks so much for showing us all about your amazing pigs, your Korean natural farming system. I think that people will get a lot of knowledge out of this and be able to go dig deeper um, so that they can do this themselves. Uh, and I'm really excited yeah. because I'm going to get to raise some of these feeders. Yeah. And uh, so the Duroc Manga Cross is going to be an amazing pig. Can't wait. And... Uh, if anybody out there is interested and you live in the Southeast Tennessee area, definitely give uh, Blake a follow over on Instagram and you can communicate with him if you'd want to yeah, purchase Yeah, send me a it. message because probably the end of March, I'm going to have a lot more of these that will be available for people to have the best pig that they could get.